educate, agitate, but do not violate. Many remember me by these words. My name is Clement Osborne Payne. I was the third of the five children of Barbadians George and Adriana Payne. Living in Passage Road, Bridgetown, I was educated at Wesley Hall Boys School and Bay Street Boys School. I started working at 16 as a junior clerk in Bridgetown. I had a passion for reading, and my spare time was spent doing that, and observing all that I could. This awakened my consciousness to the new political and democratic awareness that Clonel Wickham and Dr. Charles Duncan O'Neill were helping to inculcate in Barbados. My early 20s saw me relocating to Trinidad. I had reasoned that as Trinidad was much bigger than Barbados, I could do much more there. Feeling like a stranger among strange people, I only stayed there a short period because I didn't really understand the people or their doings. There was still something about the people and the island which held me in its bosom. What that something was, I never attempted to find out. But to my greatest surprise, I found myself back in Trinidad three years after my trial visit. The place seemed to me very prosperous on this occasion, so I decided to settle down as a cleaner and dyer. It was then that I started moving in a circle of ambitious and politically motivated young men and joined a branch of the Marcus Garvey Universal Negro Improvement Association. Fired with zeal, I developed myself as a public speaker. During the next 10 years, I assisted in organizing the first trade union in Trinidad and a local affiliate of the ANC. African National Congress. I was very active in the West Indian Youth League and the Trinidad Working Men's Association. On Good Friday, March 26, 1937, then 33 years old, I returned to Barbados and stayed with my brother Howard, who on hearing of my intentions remarked, there were powerful forces in Barbados which would not brook anyone attempting to disturb the status quo. To organize the working people of Barbados, this I went about with zeal and interest and got the help and support of a good many eager workers who were only too willing to see that the masses receive a proper political education. These included Garveyites and political activists like Israel Level, Ulrich Grant, Darnley Brian Allen, F. A. Menzies Chase, and Mortimer Skeet. From among them, I selected the most capable speakers, thus beginning my big campaign of organizing. I started a series of mass meetings. These meetings were held at the Lower Green in Cheapside and Golden Square, a notorious slum between Nelson Street and Probin Street. Here began the romance of my political career in Barbados. Slavery had been abolished for over a hundred years. However, many of the social and economic ills of slavery remained solidly in place. All this contributed to a new sense of self-worth among blacks who were growing tired of being marginalized and oppressed. From the very first meeting, the dogs of the capitalists, the term I used to refer to the police, were very interested in my activities and kept me under strict surveillance each moment, night and day. On Thursday, July 22nd, I was served with a summons to appear before the city magistrate to answer a charge of having willfully made a false statement to the harbor authorities concerning my place of birth. On arrival in the island, when I declared that I was born in Barbados rather than Trinidad, I was found guilty and ordered to pay £10, approximately $48, forthwith or serve three months in prison. 
having immediately appealed the decision, I received much support both morally and financially from the working class, much to the disappointment and displeasure of the planter merchant oligarchy and the police. Before leaving the courtyard, I announced the meeting in Golden Square that same night, which I later described in my political memoirs of Barbados as a historical one from many angles. People from every stratum of society attended. This was a strange significance in Barbados. My conviction, government's ulterior motive and my intent to march on government house for an audience with the governor was the theme. Next morning at 8 a.m., Friday, July 23rd, having cautioned my followers to be orderly and to carry no weapons of any kind, we marched from Golden Square. Accompanied by 300 supporters, we sang hymns and popular anthems based on loyalty to the British Empire. It took 30 minutes to arrive at Government House, having stopped 50 yards away and giving final instructions to them. I alone approached the entrance, where stood a well-armed company of the military. Deputy Inspector General of Police met me and politely inquired where I was going. I told him that I desired an interview with His Excellency. Next thing I knew, myself and 13 others were arrested and later charged with refusing to disperse as an assembled mob when instructed to do so by the police. We all pleaded not guilty and were remanded until later that day when everyone else was released on £25 or approximately $120 bail while mine was double at £50, $240. Soon after they dropped that charge, but surprisingly, they served me with another expulsion order signed by Governor Mark Young. While in Glendary, I received the summons that my appeal would be heard in three days. Adams, who I referred to as Orman, had received a retainer to represent me from my supporters and came to advise me to accept the expulsion order since he was confident of winning the appeal. Meanwhile, things were heating up. Large and restless crowds outside at Golden Square and other parts of Bridgetown gathered to hear passionate speeches by my associates. They rebuked the government for trying to deport me and destroy the workers' movement. One memorable statement by Menzies Chase, Today is a funny night was interpreted by the police to be a cryptic call for revolt. For this, he was eventually imprisoned for nine months, charged with sedition. On Monday, July 26, I was taken to court and single-handedly won the appeal on the false declaration charge. Adams had not shown up. However, the expulsion order remained. Hours passed as I waited, in prison to hear about the expulsion order. Word finally came, the governor had not rescinded the order. Finally, they placed me in a car with the detectives and whisked me away to the police pier on Bay Street, where I was secretly taken out to the CNS Lady Nelson, bound for Trinidad. My brother Howard was permitted on board to say farewell. My parting words were, remember to keep the fires burning, continue to hold mass meetings, organize, educate, agitate, but do not violate. Scores of people had lined the carinage to bid farewell. Not being granted their wish, they went on the rampage. They overturned cars, setting them on fire, even pushing them into the sea. They smashed every shop window on Broad Street and damaged everything that was in their way. They robbed and vandalized businesses and disorder spread to the other districts where shops and crops were looted. This continued over the next few days and when it came to an end on July 31st, it left 14 dead, 
47 wounded, 500 arrested, and millions of dollars in property damage. I was arrested on arrival in Trinidad for having forbidden literature. In exactly four months to the date of my arrival, things had definitely changed. The BBC ran a news story on the march to Government House. The British government set up the Moyne Commission of Inquiry. The following year, because of this heightened awareness, there would be more legal and social reforms. The first Barbadian trade union and political party, the first West Indies pension scheme, were established. The legislature finally passed the minimum wage bill and approved large sums for the construction and improvement of schools. Marcus Garvey would be given permission to visit Barbados and speak twice in Queen's Park. Death finally caught up with me on April 7th, 1941 after I suddenly collapsed while addressing a meeting in Port of Spain. My memory lives on and would be engraved on the landscape of Barbados in the Climate Pain Centre. A bust of me by Barbadian sculptor Arthur Edwards was placed in Golden Square where a monument was erected to the persons who lost their lives or who suffered for the cause of freedom in the 1937 revolt, thereby helping to lay the foundation for the changes which have led the creation of a democratic and modern society in Barbados.